We've been working through a little series around America and some themes and ideas that are, are essential for our nation to continue to be a place of liberty and freedom. And in this session, I want to talk about America and God we trust. If you're outside, you've got an outline. I hope it's legible still. If you're watching someplace else, you can download it from the web or the, the app. But you know, our national motto is in God we trust. It first appeared on a coin in 1864. It was on the two cent piece. But the law was passed in July of 1955, 1955, by a joint resolution of the 84th Congress. And it was approved by then President Dwight Eisenhower, requiring that in God we trust appear on all American currency. That's a pretty good declaration. You know, the historians say that the, the influence of this nation wasn't established by our military predominantly, but by our economy. So I don't think it's an accident that wherever those dollars went, in God we trust went. You know, it's unmistakable from our history as a nation that the statement on our money that our national motto is made about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of the Bible. It would just be ludicrous to suggest that President Eisenhower was referencing Buddha or Muhammad or some other faith. You see, the Judeo-Christian worldview has been the predominant worldview of the United States. And from that biblical perspective, tolerance has flourished in this nation, which is a very good thing. We are truly a melting pot of people from many nations and many religions. When we say that we're a Christian nation, it's not to suggest we're an exclusively Christian nation, that there isn't a whole menagerie of other faiths practiced and honored and respected, but the value system that has defined our nation, our legal system, our educational system, our judicial practices, our founding documents and ideas were derived from a Judeo-Christian worldview. In fact, General Dwight Eisenhower, before he was president, a letter he wrote to the troops before the invasion of Europe, the last line of that letter is this sentence, let us beseech the blessing of Almighty God upon this great and noble undertaking. He understood that the outcome of what was about to unfold was dependent upon Almighty God and not just the training of those who were going ashore. Did you know that after the attacks of 9-11, the American Bible Society distributed more than a million scriptures in our nation? That's in addition to what they made available in online versions. Just a casual review of our nation. If you travel from community to community and village to village and city to city and town to town, you'll find churches in all of those places across our nation. It's an unmistakable part of who we are as a people that in God we trust. It's our heritage and our legacy. The question is, what will this generation do to extend that to those who are coming behind us? See, it's far more unique. It's a far more unique statement about our nation, I think, than we realize. Today, in Saudi Arabia, they're a friend of our nation, an ally, but in the nation of Saudi Arabia, there's not a single church. Christians and churches in Afghanistan this evening are under tremendous siege. It would not be a good idea to have a gathering like this. In fact, throughout the Middle East, Christians endure hardship and persecution. Communism and socialism has gotten a lot of discussion lately. Communist regimes have aggressively sought to silence Christians in the church. In the Soviet Union, China, Cuba, Closed churches and imprisoned Christian leaders were a part of the normal behavior. We have developed for several decades now in American academia the habit of combing through American history to identify our failures and our darkest chapters and then to retell them. And while doing that, we were very reluctant to identify the good things the American people have accomplished. I would submit to you that that pattern is evil. I don't believe it's sound academics nor a fair reporting of history. Just as an example, I love people. We're the image bearers of Almighty God. There is a dignity in every human being. We're a very different lot, 
But if the only people stories you ever hear were the atrocities that human beings committed, the accounts of the serial killers, the rapists, the thieves, the self-absorbed, the immoral, your conclusion would be that people are irredeemable, that there's nothing worthwhile in the lot. It's a very destructive way to view people or life or our history. We've got to pay a bit more attention. The reality is we live under authority. We live under God's authority and we live under civil authority. In fact, every one of us has a dual citizenship. And I don't mean more than one passport. But we have a dual citizenship. You have a citizenship for this present world order, a citizenship in some nation. I'm a citizen of this nation. I've got a little blue passport. With that come certain rights and responsibilities, privileges, and things for which I'll be held to count. But I'm also a citizen of a spiritual kingdom. And so are you. If you've never tended that spiritual kingdom, if you've never given intentional thought, you're a participant in the kingdom of darkness. If you've had a revelation of Jesus of Nazareth and you've chosen to serve him as Lord, acknowledged him as the Messiah, the Son of God, the Bible describes something supernatural happening to us that we are born into that kingdom, the eternal kingdom of God. So that every one of us carry that dual citizenship. It's a very important idea with which to live. Because you have responsibilities in both of those realms. I love this country but that is always subjected to my first priority, which is pleasing God. And sometimes we struggle to, to separate the two. So I'm not coaching you towards some form of crude nationalism, where you simply use your faith to, to baptize any behavior that we might demonstrate as a people. Neither am I suggesting that everything that is legal in this nation is a good thing for you or appropriate in God's eyes. There are things that are legal but are very ungodly. That's the assignment of the church. So let the truth of Almighty God influence the culture in which we live, no matter which culture we find ourselves living under the civil authority of. We still have a kingdom responsibility to stand up for kingdom principles and to avoid our responsibilities by simply saying, well, that it's the law of the land and it's legal, is to absolve or to ignore our assignments as a part of the kingdom of God. Now, I think it's worth noting that our spiritual authority is not defined by race or by nationality or by any of those other things that we use to distinguish ourselves other than our spiritual alignment. In John chapter 8 and verse 44, Jesus is speaking to a group of the Jewish leaders in the city of Jerusalem. So they're born to the right families. They have the right religious rules. They're people with a covenant with God. They celebrate the right holidays. They read the right scriptures. They know the God stories of his redemptive work. Listen to what Jesus says to them in John 8, 44. You belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desire. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. And when he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. How do you suppose that the audience Jesus was addressing responded to that? You don't have to be very creative. They were less than thrilled. Jesus said, you're of your father, the devil, and he's the father of lies, and you're no better. And yet they were covenant people. They belonged to the right group, born in the right families. But Jesus was identifying a different authority in their life, a spiritual authority over them. We've been a bit guilty of this. You see, liberty and freedom don't come to us from governments. They come from God. And I think we have been a bit deceived in imagining that the best things in our lives have come because of political alignments or politicians or founding documents or the strength of an economy, or some other aspect of the nation where we happen to be living. But the reality is the best thing in our lives come from the hand of Almighty God. And to the extent that we yield our hearts to Him and serve Him as Lord and King, those things will be extended to those who follow us. We're the inheritors of something quite remarkable. There's never been any quite, anything quite like it in the history of nations. A nation willing to align themselves with Almighty God. Not an exclusively Christian nation, not with a state church, not with a state dictating how we worship or not worship, but with a group of people 
broadly distributed amongst the population who had a desire to honor God. And on the heels of that, we have seen one awakening after another come to our nation because we needed it, because we would drift off course. We're not the first generation to drift into immorality and ungodliness and selfishness and sit in our churches and imagine we're safe. It's a part of our story. But God in his mercy would pour out his spirit upon us and we would humble ourselves in repentance and humility and the fear of God would grow within us again and we would lay aside our ungodliness and our wickedness and renew our commitment to honor the Lord with our lives for the sake of our children. It's the assignment before us. I believe God is awakening us again. There's a story in Matthew 8. We've talked about it before, but I think it's on point with this notion of living under authority. It's Jesus is in Capernaum, the city where he, he set up his public ministry. When he left his hometown in Nazareth, he moved to Capernaum. It's a fishing village on the northern end of the Sea of Galilee. An unlikely place, other than the fact that it was located on a major uh, roadway, Roman road through the ancient world. The, the Sea of Galilee is the largest fresh water source in the region. So Jesus set up his ministry in a place that ensured him a, a, a busy traffic stream of travelers, international travelers. It says when he entered Capernaum, a centurion came and asked for help. And he said, Lord, my servant is at home paralyzed and in terrible suffering. And Jesus responded in the most odd way. He said, I'll go and heal him. Jesus demonstrated very little interest in helping anyone other than the covenant people of God. In fact, he said to a Syrophoenician woman who came and asked for help for one of her children, he said, it's not right to take the bread from the master's table and give it to the dogs. So when this Roman centurion comes, if you have any familiarity with the narrative, you're thinking Jesus is going to rebuff him. And Jesus said, I'll go and heal him. It's a remarkable story. Everything about it is just, and the centurion replied, Lord, I don't deserve to have you come under my roof. Just say the word and my servant will be healed. And here's the punchline. I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. And I tell this one go and he goes and that one come and he comes. And I say to my servant, do this. And he does it. The next line says, when Jesus heard this, he was astonished. Astonishing faith in the heart of a Roman centurion. That's unexpected. When he talked to the religious leaders in Jerusalem, he said, you're of your father, the devil. But this Roman centurion has a faith in God that astonishes our Lord. I would like to have that kind of faith, wouldn't you? Wouldn't you like Jesus to look at your heart and go, did you see that? Do you understand that? The man said, I'm a man under authority. Now he was under civil authority. He was under the authority of the Roman army, ultimately of Caesar. There were a set of rules and parameters that dictated his life and the liberties he had or didn't have. He understood authority and he recognized in Jesus, he had a revelation. You see, what we know of Jesus really comes to us by revelation. It doesn't come through our study, through our intellect, through our good works. It's the grace of God that reveals Jesus to every one of us. And this man had an understanding that had to have come from God. He said, I'm a man under authority to myself. I can tell a soldier what to do or a servant what to do. But I recognize in you a spiritual authority, not a civil authority. And if you'll simply speak the word, my servant will be healed. I would submit to you, we haven't had the awareness of spiritual authority to a sufficient degree. We've imagined that our future will be dictated by civil authorities now, those authorities will have influence upon our lives. I'm not diminishing that. I'm not trying to turn you away from that. But when I say to you, I love our country, I love our country because of the faith that it has held out. Not because we've walked perfectly or we make every decision right, either historically or today. We're still struggling to find our way. And we need the influence of the word of God and the leading of the Holy Spirit and the authority of Jesus in our lives to help us. And to the extent that God's people lack the courage to hold those things into the public square, we will come increasingly under authoritarian control. But if we find the courage to yield our hearts and our lives to the Lordship of Jesus and to submit to the authority of the Word of God and lay aside our own selfish dictates 
We will find a freedom that only impacts our lives and our children's lives, but the generations who follow us. Now that'll require a bit of a different response from the church. But I believe God is awakening us in new ways. I want to submit to you that we can learn to trust God. It's not something that comes to us intuitively. It's not automatic. It doesn't come with tenure. You can't attend church long enough and just automatically know how to trust God. It won't come because your grandparents took you to church and your parents took you to church. It begins with a decision in your heart. In fact, most of the important aspects of your faith begin with a decision of your will, far more than an emotional response. God created us with feelings and they enrich our lives. Our lives are diminished without them. But the more important challenges of your life begin with your will, with the choices you make. Now, your feelings will feed that, but learning to trust God in Psalm 20 and beginning in verse 1, it says, may the Lord answer you when you are in distress. May the name of the God of Jacob protect you. May he send you help from the sanctuary and grant you support from Zion. May he remember all your sacrifices and accept your offerings. I like that proclamation. In fact, I'd like to make that proclamation over you. May I do that? Would you be willing to receive it? You want to consciously receive the things that God has for you. Not just expect them to find you. I want to say it, I'd like to repeat it if, you'll, if you're ready to, maybe you turn your palms up. Maybe you want to close your eyes. If your kids are with you, maybe you take their hand. It can be a pronouncement over your family. May the Lord answer you when you are in distress. May the name of God of Jacob protect you. May he send you help from the sanctuary and grant you support from Zion. May he remember all your sacrifices and accept your offerings. Amen. Now the psalm goes on to say, may he give you the desire of your heart and make all your plans succeed. We will shout for joy when you are victorious and lift up our banners in the name of our God. May the Lord grant you all of your requests. Now I know that the Lord saves his anointed. He answers him from his holy heaven with the saving power of his right hand. Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord, our God. Folks, that's our future. Placing our trust in increasing increments in the Lord, our God. And we have been guilty of trusting in many other things. You know, not so much horses and chariots, that's from another generation, but we've trusted in our military strength or our economic might or our pol political parties or political leaders or whomever. And, and it may be that God could use any of those things to bring his deliverance, but our trust is rooted in the God of heaven and earth. And we want to learn to trust him more fully. In seasons of shaking and turmoil, it's very important to learn to trust God. So I brought you just two or three things that are a part of that process. If we're going to grow in our trust of the Lord, you'll have to know the truth. In John 8, 31, it's a familiar verse. I suspect Jesus said, you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. In order to find the freedom, you have to know the truth. You'll have to value it. You'll have to care about it. In fact, in Proverbs chapter two, it said, if you accept my words and store up my commands within you, it begins by accepting it, but then you've got to make room to store it, to accumulate it, to commit it to your memory, to keep it in your mind and your thoughts. If you'll turn your ear to wisdom and apply your heart to understanding, if you'll call out for insight and cry aloud for understanding, if you'll look for it as silver and search for it as hidden treasure, how do you know the truth? by having an intense longing, if you search for it, if you store it up, if you retain it, if you meditate upon it, don't treat it casually. Do I have to read my Bible? No, you don't have to. You don't have to. It's a choice you make. Now, if you intend to grow up in the Lord and sustain your faith, you get to read your Bible. We've treated it way too casually. We've been indifferent we got, oh, what's the big deal? I can go to church and hear a sermon. There's a big difference in hearing a sermon and knowing the word of God. And I spent my life working on sermons, but that, that's still the truth. You want to know the truth of God. And more importantly, you want to know about your circumstances, not the theoretical truth of God. 
I, don't, I find that God doesn't particularly deal in a great deal of theoretical truth. In my life, it's very much about applied truth. In fact, the only times I want to talk about theoretical truth is when the applied truth is awkward. <laughs> when God's disciplining me, I would rather talk about Greek verbs. <laughs> but God has typically dealt with me in, in, with the application of his truth in my life. Which leads me to the second point of growing in trust. We've got to put truth into practice. In James 1, it says, don't merely listen to the word and deceive yourself. Do what it says. I would submit to you, it's really not incumbent upon God to give you any further insight or understanding until you begin to practice obedience to the truth that you know. God does not present us with a smorgasbord. It's not a cafeteria line where you can walk through it and choose commandment 1, 3, and 8. When you can choose the portions of the truth that are comfortable to you or convenient to you. And, you know, I, I, I interact with Christians a lot and people will say to me, you know, Pastor, I, I know what the Bible says, but let me tell you what I think. Well, I'm grateful that you can still think. That's an accomplishment and achievement. and I hope you maintain that ability, but my, my counsel would be to submit your wisdom to the authority of God. We've got to be willing to put the truth into practice, and that's not always comfortable. I learned a line many years ago that truth divorced from experience will always dwell in the realm of doubt. There's a big difference in having an idea or having a fact and having an experience. My father, when I was growing up, was a veterinarian, and so we were around a lot of, and you would have to go to where the horses were. They didn't bring very many horses to the clinic. So we were always traveling to somebody's farm or barn, and one of the ways that people would, would protect their horses, they'd put an electric fence around a corral or a stable or someplace. And I was always very interested in if the, if the electricity was disconnected. <laughs> Have you ever grabbed hold of an electric fence? Maybe early in the morning when there's still a lot of dew on the grass. It's a spiritual experience. <laughs> I'm telling you, there will be words pour out of you that you didn't know were in you. And I remember one time I was with my dad and we were, we'd arrived and there was an electric fence around the, the place where the horse that we were to, to examine was. And I had a stainless steel bucket in one hand that he often used and it had water in it. It was early enough in the day that the grass was still wet. And I, well, I was getting the things out of the truck. He said, I'll go unplug the fence. And I said, good. So I got my stuff together before he got back. And I trust him. He's a man of integrity and honesty. But I'd had that experience with that electric fence before. So I just stood there with my wet feet and stainless steel bucket and waited for him to touch it. And when he grabbed hold of it with no reaction, I followed suit. Experience informs your truth. I'll give you another horse story while we're on the road. A horse will not run over you. If you're in a pasture and there's a horse running at you, if you'll just make the least bit of motion and a slight bit of noise, they'll go around you. A cow will run over you. Okay, I'm not explaining, I'm just reporting. All right? So from the time I was rather small, we'd have to help my dad. We'd go on a call to treat a horse, and a lot of times you'd have to catch the horse in a pasture. So you'd walk it towards a corner, and when you got it in the corner, they'll generally stop and wait for you to come up. Most of them are pretty domesticated. But usually somewhere along that way, they'll turn and face you. And whether they're bluffing or they really mean it, they're going to take a few steps in your direction. Now, I had been given the information that a horse will not run over you just like I gave you. But when there's 1,200 pounds of animal blowing saliva and whatever else in your direction and making noise, what I knew up here was different than what my feet believed. And on the first few occasions, one of those animals started my direction and got within a reasonable proximity. I abandoned my post. And the horse would escape, and we'd have to start the process all over again. I was going to have to do it again. But the first time I held my ground and the horse stopped, or at the very worst, went around me because I was afraid to move over there to try to stop it. I began to build my own experience and to trust the truth that I had been given until I came to understand that was a reality. 
And you see, we've spent our lives in church hearing sermons or perhaps reading your Bible in a theoretical sense or accumulating facts and history and social customs of Scripture, but we haven't been as fully developed on the practice of the truth that we've known. And without the experience to support it, we have remained a rather weak and anemic expression of the church in the earth. And I believe God is very intent on growing up his people right now. Which leads me to the third piece. We've got to be willing to submit ourselves to training. It's not a new idea to us. We've talked about it on many occasions. Hebrews 5 and verse 14 says, Solid food is for the mature who by constant youth have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. Who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. It's not a revelation from God. It's not an expression of one of the manifestations of the Spirit and the discerning of spirits. It's that we have given ourselves to the truth of God and the practice of the truth so that we can distinguish good from evil. You know, you may say, well, that's simple. It's not simple right now. There is enormous pressure in the public square around this discussion of good and evil. And we need a God perspective because we have an an allegiance and a responsibility and will be held accountable to a spiritual authority that's greater than a civil authority. And you and I need to understand good and evil. There's some training involved in that. And it's not just always apparent. You know, training is, a, is, is not a complex idea, but it's an idea that has some requirements with it. It requires discipline. And good training comes with some instruction. It's not just how I want to behave. Have you ever trained physically for a, an event or a sport or a race? Or, you know, it's not just what you would like to do. I'd like to run 100 yards and have a pint of ice cream. Run another 100 yards and have a few Oreos. But with a little training, I found that I was going to have to adjust my dietary desires. And you and I will have to submit, submit to some discipline and to some instruction. And then training brings with it sacrifice. If you're truly training for something, it has a sacrificial component to it. Now, if you bring that to training for godliness submitted to discipline, willing to accept instruction, and being willing to make a sacrifice. That's how we will gain dexterity in discerning between good and evil. See, training, again, it's not complex. It's engaging in a behavior that would enable you to accomplish something in the future that you couldn't accomplish today, no matter how sincerely you tried. Christians have confused sincerity with outcomes. I've talked to so many people through the years and have said, well, you know, I, I, was, I was very, very sincere. Well, I appreciate that. But if I have to have surgery tomorrow, I prefer a medical profession who's trained as opposed to someone who is ignorant and sincere. In fact, when the anesthesiologist comes in and says, I'm about to... To start your drip, you want to count back from 100, and the doctor's standing behind his shoulder and said, you know, I've never done this procedure, but I sincerely want you to get better. I'm coming off the table. Wires and all. And we have rather naively imagined that if we were sincere, the outcomes should be there. So when I go back to chapters in my life where the outcomes haven't been great, and I thought, well, I, I meant well. I was trying Trying isn't enough when the outcomes really matter. Training is required. And we've been a bit confused. We've been a bit sloppy, a bit indifferent. So I want to invite you to this notion of allowing the the trust of God to grow in your heart and to be willing to submit yourselves to a training from the Spirit of God. And then one last component. Training is most effective when you're not under threat. Training is most effective in your life when you're not under threat. You know, if we're training for athletics, they say you'll play like you practice. So you want to get the behaviors ingrained when you're not under the stress of of real-time competition. And I know we use a lot of life and death language around sports and activities, but they're not. At the end of one of those games, you take a shower and, and rehydrate. But there are circumstances in your life where the outcomes are life and death. And it's very, very difficult 
to figure out how to hear from the Lord and how to trust God and to place your trust in him more completely when, when everything is in the balance. It's much, much easier to begin to build a trust in God and a trust in his word and a confidence in him. Begin to practice the truth that you know and submit your life to him and begin to train in spiritual things before you face those consequences that are so significant. It's really hard to figure out how to use a sling while Goliath is shouting at you. You wouldn't want your first healing prayer to be at Lazarus' tomb. That's just a stiff hill to climb. Do you understand the principle? So you want to begin where you are, in the place where you are. Tell your God's story. Share your story. When you think, nah, it doesn't matter that much, that's the time to learn. Gain the courage to say, I'm one of those Jesus people. I pray for our nation every day. I pray for our community. I I pray for the school boards. I pray for the city council and the county commission. I'm one of those goofy people. Would you like to join me for a prayer? Tell your God's story. Secondly, take those let's pray moments when somebody is sharing with you, having a casual conversation and they introduce a a challenge in their life. Just say, let's pray. Don't wait for permission. Just pray. Lord, help my friend in Jesus' name. Amen. I was in a meeting this week. Somebody else on staff was with me and the the, the people we were meeting with shared a a need in their family. They had a daughter with with a great need and you know, the, the moment came and went. The, they'd made the appointment, and I, I was just asleep at the wheel. They told the story, and we went on to the rest of the things that were in their, their they'd come to talk about. And when we got done, we were kind of saying our goodbyes, and the, the, the person that worked with me stepped up and said, well, are we going to pray for his daughter? And I'm like, yeah, what an idea. It doesn't matter who you are and how many times you've prayed, you'll miss those moments. We need one another. We've got to find the courage to let our faith impact the world we live in. And you won't always get it right. But if you'll cooperate with the Lord, I was at least clever enough at that point to say, well, yes, I want to pray. Let's pray. Come on. They got more than a sentence. Then I'd accumulated several minutes of prayers. But it wasn't because I was spiritual or I was particularly discerning. I was focused on what they'd come for. I missed the God moment in the midst of that. But what happens in the midst of that is you begin to trust God for healing in people's lives, deliverance in people's lives, restoration in people's lives. It moves our faith from a theoretical accumulation of information into the practical arena where we live, and that's where it has to be. If we're going to cultivate a trust in the Lord, See, it's much easier for us to formulate a theology that says we'll just get rescued out of this before it gets really bad. Look, I'm I'm in. I want out of here on the first load up. I'm not volunteering for any extra suffering. But the timing of that isn't just exactly clear and how much we're going to be asked to endure. And life apart from the end of the age is challenging enough. We need the help and the power of Almighty God. And we want to begin to train now to invite God into our lives, to pray for one another. Say, Lord, help me to learn. Help me to listen. Help me to think. So are you one of those people? Yes, I am. You believe God heals? Yes, I do. I believe he delivers and restores and renews. Doesn't mean every prayer I pray gets answered in the way I want it to pray, but I know my God is a healer. He built you to heal. Your body is designed to heal. If I drop my iPhone, it does not heal. There's an upcharge. And if I cut my hand, it heals. It's amazing. When we ask God to bring healing or restoration or deliverance, we're asking him to to do what he created us to do. Why would we apologize for that? Because you have someone you love or care about that didn't get the outcome you wanted? I understand a bit of the pain of that. I'm not suggesting it's easy. Jesus didn't heal everybody he met. But it shouldn't stop us from extending the power of God to our generation. Would you only send people to the doctor 
if, if you knew that if they wouldn't get well, you wouldn't send them? I think not. What has happened to us? Why are we so timid? Why are we so reluctant? Why are we so embarrassed and hesitant? The Spirit of God is amongst us. You're already about half crazy. You'll sit in the rain for church. I want to pray for you. Our time's gone, but I want to pray for you. Some of you need a God event tonight. There are people here that need a miracle or someone that you love or care about needs a miracle. And only the hand of God can bring about an outcome that's acceptable. I'd like to pray with you. I believe God restores and delivers and heals. He can deliver us from habits. He can deliver us from addictive behaviors. He can deliver us from our failure in our past. The cross of Jesus Christ is sufficient. The shed blood of Jesus is adequate. Hallelujah. I'm not opposed to medicine or doctors. In fact, I'm most grateful for them, for their training and their sacrifice and the, the, the quality of life they make available to all of us. It's a tremendous gift. If you're not saying thank you to that community, you need to be. But that doesn't diminish my confidence in God. I'm grateful for the strength of our economy, but I'm not trusting that to secure my future. But if you're here tonight and you need a miracle or somebody you love needs a miracle, I'm just going to ask you to stand real quickly wherever you are. I'm not going to take long. If you're in one of the other sanctuaries, you can stand right there. If you're watching online, stand up in your living room. The Lord knows. It's important. Don't just sit there laid back. Wake up. It's time to pray. Our God is a healer and a deliverer and a restorer. Amen. Hallelujah. Father, we come tonight in the authority of Jesus' name to thank you for your grace and your mercy for us, that you're a God who heals and restores and delivers. But I thank you that we live in a nation where we can stand in public and declare Jesus is Lord without fear of reprisal or persecution. We praise you for the great liberties and freedoms that we have. Forgive us when we've taken them for granted. Forgive us for our indifference. But we pray for one another tonight. Nothing is hidden from you. You know every circumstance, every detail, every diagnosis, every addiction, every failure, every shortcoming. And we come now and we ask that the power of God would bring life and freedom and wholeness to us in Jesus' name. We praise you for it. Father, for we are weak, you are strong. And where we have felt threatened, we stand in your courage tonight. Let a boldness come to us from you. A boldness not just to receive for ourselves, but to extend the hope of a risen Christ to the world in which we live. We praise you for it. We thank you tonight for the response to the treatments that will cause even the doctors to be amazed. For the freedom and deliverance, Lord, open doors where there's been no way. Bring possibilities to circumstances that have been hopeless. Let the power of God come upon us as it's never come before. We thank you for it and we praise you for it. For it's in Jesus' name we pray and we believe together. Amen. Hallelujah. Hey, this is Pastor Allen. Thank you for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, like it, and most importantly, share it with your friends. If you want to be notified when there's new content and we post new material, if you'll just subscribe to my channel and hit the bell, you'll get the notification. Most of all, I pray God blesses you as you continue on your spiritual journey and open your heart to the Lord. God bless.